This is Pod Populi, podcast for the people. The Great Love Debate. It's the Great Love Debate. The Great Love Debate. It's the Great Love Debate. Hi again, everyone. It's Brian Howie. Welcome to the Great Love Debate, the world's number one dating and relationship podcast. Since 2015, I am here in the very fine and fancy studios of Pod Populi podcast for the people. I am at the one in uh, Cle. I mean, it's just outside of Cleveland. It's about ten miles from downtown Cleveland, Lynnhurst, Ohio. It is one of the newest ones. It is in a lovely complex called uh, Legacy Village. And I got to say, you know, you guys who listen to the show, you know, I'm always a fan of Cleveland. But when it is nice, which is not a lot, it's very nice. I say that about Chicago a lot. That if it was uh, seventy degrees everywhere for one day, on that day, Chicago wins. It's not 70 degrees nearly enough in Chicago or Cleveland, so neither one of them win a lot. But when they do, they do. Um, a little bit of a news dump here. And uh, it's a little bit of a different show. I'm going to explain some things and um, whatever. So uh, as you guys know, this podcast came out of um, the Great Love Debate tour. And that tour came out of my book I wrote called How to Find Love in 60 Seconds that I no longer stand behind uh, 90% of that book because I hadn't done the tour yet. So this, uh, the tour started uh, January 14th, 2014 at the Center Stage Theater in Santa Barbara. It was supposed to be a promotional stunt, a one-night event um, to promote the book, and that was supposed to be it. I did not even host it. I was on the stage. Uh, my good friend uh, and prolific best-selling author Joe Piazza did the honors of hosting. I was just one of a handful of people on the stage. It was supposed to be just a quick little promotional stunt. Um, talk about love, dating, relationships, and that would be that. Well, that turned into something else, and um, people uh, heard about how it went in Santa Barbara, and so two weeks later, I got booked at, uh, I think it was the Long Beach Performing Arts Center in Long Beach, California, and then I did another one, and then I thought, hey, maybe let's, there's something here, and I started barnstorming pretty much city to city. I went to Boston, worked my way through the East Coast, and one thing led to another, and, and, and you know, 11 seasons of this later, 450-something um, live shows and I think 164 cities, dozen countries. Um, we have done the Great Love Debate live show all over the world. Thousands of people, thousands of laughs, perspectives, the, the, the famous and the not-so-famous um, coming together to share or look for something special, something great. And I always said my, my role in, in that show was to, to raise the questions and not necessarily give the answers. And even on this podcast, my, my job has always been to raise the questions. I just think for that live show uh, and how long I've been doing it and the, and the toll that the travel takes, and I already travel a lot for, for my regular life, um, I think it's time. I, I think that I need to step off the stage. Uh, so the... And I know people who listen to this podcast a lot are probably going to say that I have had more, um, more finales than, than Elton John, but I think this really is it. So I'm not sure how many shows I'm going to do between, between the time I'm recording this and the time of the last show, which I'm telling you right now. There are probably going to be a couple more in there because I owe some shows to some cities, but the last one, the tour finale, will be November 6th at the Boca Black Box uh, Center for the Arts in Boca Raton, Florida. So you might be like, that's weird. Why, are you, why did you start in Santa Barbara and why did you end in Florida? Well, um, I like the sunshine, but why am I choosing to end it there? I've done more shows uh, than anywhere in New York City. I have done residencies in Minneapolis, Chicago, L.A. I, you know, there's a lot of places where I have done bigger shows, more shows, you know, and this is, I don't know, I think it's about 350 seats. It's not our biggest venue. Um, I'm not even sure it's my favorite venue, and I'm not even sure the best shows are in Florida because they are a, a particularly nutty group there, and sometimes the, the conversation that happens at these shows get a little bit out of control. But why am I picking to choose it there? Um, the first time I played that theater, it was October 2019, and on my way to LAX out of Los Angeles, um, to fly to that show, I had to do a news thing in the morning. Uh, I was in the back of a lift on my way about two miles from the airport, and um, 
we got hit from behind and it was just a terrible, terrible uh, car accident. And um, if you go back to, to this podcast and listen to somewhere mid-October, uh, I did a podcast about it maybe a week later. It, it, was, it, was a, it was a really, really rough time and rough set of injuries. But I didn't know how badly I was hurt. Um, you know, I went in the ambulance, went to the emergency room. They, they're like, oh, maybe you broke a rib, blah, blah, blah. And I, I couldn't process the pain properly. And so I got back on an airplane the next day and I did a show 48 hours later at that theater. I got on the stage after this awful car in unfathomable amounts of pain. And I had uh, 21 broken bones, as it turns out, 13 broken ribs, broken leg, broken vertebrae, broken scapula, internal injuries. Um, but I was stupid and I was stubborn and I didn't know how badly I was hurt, um, but I got through it. And I've probably played that venue, uh, I don't know, four or five times since, maybe once a year. We, we, I go back there, and until recently, I always had sort of a, a, a bit of PTSD every time I went back there because I would remember that night, and I remember the pain, and I thought I was just going to die on a stage. Um, but I never want to cancel a show despite all those shows that canceled on me during the COVID days. But, um, and I did it, and I, uh, I survived it. And um, I just think surviving that situation and that night gave me a warm sense of pride and fondness and gratitude for that theater and for that community and for that experience and for doing the great love debate in general, like I, I, I just realized how much I enjoyed doing that show that I was willing to do it no matter what. And, um, you know, that was five something years ago and probably haven't done as many shows since. I know I definitely haven't done as many shows since because as I just said, the, the world shut down for a while, kind of killed the momentum. But I'm like, you know, that was the hardest. Sh- people tell me all the time, what was the hardest show to do? And they always ask me in terms of crowd or in terms of feistiness or in terms of location or whatever that was the hardest show and that um but like i said i don't look back on that badly i look at back on that like we did this and we meaning me the crowd the people on the stage i mentioned at the beginning that i was kind of playing hurt and um and not medicated though i probably should have been um and the crowd got me through it and and the energy of what we do all of the time at the great love debate got me through it. And I just, uh, feel really good. As you know, I have, I, you know, sometimes record, uh, this podcast at Pod Populi in Boca Raton, Florida. That was my first time in that city. Um, and so there's a lot of things about that that I'm like, you know what, if I'm going to wrap that up, they've always been good to me. I'll wrap this tour up. That's where I want to do it. So that's where I'm going to do it. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about a few more things. I just wanted to open up with that. I got to take a quick break because we still have to pay for things like airplane tickets to Boca Raton, Florida to do shows. Um, And we will be back right after this. And we are back. So, you know, as, as I said, you know, my job was to raise the questions and not give the answers. For the live show, I think I have too many of the answers. Not nearly all of the answers, like I will never have that, but I think enough of it that when I go into a city, if it's not a new city, I don't quite have as much curiosity on it as I used to. I sort of know where all the bodies are buried. Like if I do a show in Philadelphia, I know where a lot of the dating bodies are buried there, and not that that doesn't make it any more fun, and the audience obviously doesn't know, but a little bit of my mojo to to work through is restricted by the format of the evening. You kind of have to, every show is different, every crowd's different, every night's different, but there's certain beats in a, in a theater show, comedy show, whatever you want to say, that you have to beat, so, to have to get through so that you see that the show starts here and the show ends here and you have to end in sort of a hopeful place despite uh, 90 minutes of um, bitching and whining and dating disasters, we have to get through it. And like I said, I don't want to ever make it seem like everything is different, but a lot of the things that are raised hit a certain format. There is something to the show. And and not that I'm ever restricted by that, because within that context, it can go in any sort of direction. But I don't quite have the freedom. So people are like, well, how can you quit the live show, but you're still going to do the podcast? The podcast allows anything to happen. 
and we have done slightly more podcast episodes than we have done live shows, which tells you how many live shows I did back in the day. I was always on the road. But the podcast can talk about anything. I can talk about this. Um, I am not so restricted. I can talk to one person about one experience. I can do that, and you're not inhibited by people who paid, you know, 55 bucks and two drinks to go to come see it live. So that is the difference that, that, um, that I feel uninhibited and I feel that there's no restrictions on, on this podcast, which is why this podcast is going to go as long as I, uh, forever. I mean, I'm never going to, going to want to, um, stop talking about this stuff. People say that to me a lot. Like, do you ever run out of things to talk about on the podcast? No, I'll be talking about this anyway. There's so many ways to skin this apple and so many layers to this and so many things to revisit and the world changes all the time and I change all the time and, 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 uh, and that's another part of it. You know, somebody said to me when I, when I mentioned that um, everything I just brought about, like why I booked it in Boca Raton, I talked to, to the guy who, who runs the theater there. He's a really good guy and, and I explained that to him and he goes, you're kind of emotional about this and I'm like, I didn't have emotion sadly, before I started doing the great love debate, I really didn't. I really lived in a emotionally walled off space and uh, I was never too high and I was never too low. And, and, um, and even when we started the great love debate, I, it was a lot more Jerry Springerish. It was a lot more men against the women. You know, I produced a play once called um, Boys, Dumb, Girls, Crazy. It had a lot of elements of that in it. And, uh, and early on, I I think a lot of people left those shows, not that they weren't fun and funny, but feeling a little bit more validated in their misery. And I didn't, I didn't want that. And somewhere along the line, I didn't make a conscious change to change it. I, I think I changed. I started to hear people, um, sharing and revealing and talking about things, especially the men that I was like. I'm the weirdo here. I'm the one who has not having proper relationships. I'm the one who, who I was like, oh, dating's easy. Girls like me. What's the problem here? I was the one who is not putting all my chips on the table. And all of these, you know, experience I've had in relationships and and my various girlfriends would say like, you just don't understand what I'm talking about. Do you? And I would answer. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, Doing the great love debate made me understand. It made me open up. And all of these people in all of these theaters and comedy clubs and live music venues all over the world, and we have done this show in Sydney and Tel Aviv and Montreal and all kinds of locations, um, made me have to go deeper and drove me into therapy and made me have to think, what am I missing? What am I not sharing? How am I not growing? What have I missed in my life um, that was somehow unfulfilling? And, and that's what doing these shows did, just hearing people, me stick a microphone in their face and say, stand the fuck up. And I would say that. I'm like, get the fuck up. Like, if you've been to one of our shows, I'm, I'm kind of a dick, but that, that's what you have to do to wrangle hundreds of people to reveal good, bad, funny, strange, painful in front of you know, they're dating peers, for lack of a better term. And that's not always easy for some people. Like we do shows in, you know, a place like San Jose, California, or or Silicon Valley, or or, um, Portland, or Seattle, of course, where there's a lot of, at best, socially awkward and introverted people who are um, not likely to share one-on-one, much less in front of people in the room. And I am pretty ballsy and a little bit alpha on the, like, get the fuck up and share. And if they were willing to do that, and if I was willing to putting people in a position to say, you've got to talk about this in front of people, then I had to be willing to do that too. And I couldn't just do that, you know, one-on-one or in the privacy of a therapist office. I had to reveal, you know, a lot of my own stuff. I had, you know, you've heard me talk about, um, in the past, uh, you know, I never trusted my parents' love for each other, which means I didn't trust their love for me, which means I didn't trust the concept of it. So the fact that I'm doing the great love debate, a lot of that is rooted in all of this. Uh, I got interviewed for um, for Nightline on ABC a couple of years ago, 
And uh, after the interview was over, the reporter, um, I forget her name, was it Deborah Roberts? Maybe. She goes, can I ask you something? And I said, yeah. And she goes, you, you talk about this as, you know, you call the great love debate the world's greatest social experiment on love, and it's in your press materials and all that. And I go, yeah, 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 it is. And she goes, is this whole thing about you? And at first I, I thought that the answer to that felt too, way too self-centered, and, and if that was the case, but I had to think about it, and I'm like, I think this is about me. And I think raising the questions of everybody else really is about raising the questions um, of myself. And so when I say that, that I know the answers to a lot of the questions, well, I have had to do that work and I have had to answer. So if anybody asked me a question, you know, nine years ago or the beginning of this tour, I would have given them the answer most likely to elicit a laugh. I would have given them a snarky answer. People that would ask me then, they would stand up in the show and they're like, how come you're not married yet? And I would say the day's not over. That's a fun answer, but it's not the real answer. It's because I wasn't willing to or able to or ready to or put it in a situation where I'm like, aha, this is what all of those people were talking about. This is what they mean. This is what this show means. And so doing this over and over and over in different cities and, you know, um, different crowds, different types of places. And, but the through line in it was everybody had some fear. Everybody had some pain. Everybody wasn't willing to go into that mental, physical, emotionally scary place outside of their comfort zone to seek the answers. And so this was me doing this. I spent, you know, 20 something years in show business, um, writer, director, producer before I ever became the talent and the great love debate. Suddenly I had to be the talent. And, uh, you know, people ask me all the time, like, oh, you've done stand-up comedy? No, I have not. You've performed? No, I have not. I hid behind other people's talents and put my voice through words and screenplays and plays and TV shows, and I was never comfortable being out front. Like I even said, even the first Great Love Debate, it was never that. Um, and then uh, the longtime producer of this show, and, and maybe the... Um, smartest person and most in tune with who I am and what I'm doing, um, the two-time Emmy Emmy award-winning Keiko, she said, she forced me, she's like, you're, this is you. It's a great love debate with Brian Howie. Like, this is it. You've got to put your name to this. You've got to own this. You've got to understand that if you're asking this of other people, you have got to be the conduit. And so a lot of times being the conduit you know, that puts me in a position where I have to really think and I have to really feel and I have to really, and all these things that I never do. You can have a really nice life um, coasting around in, uh, in, especially in show business without putting yourself in a position to get hurt, without putting yourself in a position to, um, to put all your chips on the table. And doing the great love debate has made me put my chips on the table. And because in order to be authentic for the audience and not just make them laugh, it's one thing to make people laugh. It's a whole other thing to make people think. It is hard to make people think. And it's another thing to make people feel. I had to do all these things myself. And so that's what the great love debate has done for me. So that's why I feel like, am I going to miss doing this show? Every time I, I, I've said this before, like, I don't want to do this show anymore. I travel. And then I do it. And I'm like, oh, my God, that was the greatest night. I can't believe that I would even consider not doing it anymore. I've considered this. This is there's some thought going into this. There's some timing going into this. It's just time. You know, I wanted to be like, oh, last year, 10 years, nice bookend, whatever. And then, you know, creeped into an 11th because they call and they offer and it's tough to turn down money and opportunity. But I wanted to be honest about it. Like, this will be our last show barring (laughs) changing my mind. (laughs) The Rolling Stones are still going around. But so there might be some iterations of this. There might be some special live podcasts, which I will do. So I don't know if I'm completely putting down the microphone in front of a crowd altogether. But this version of uh, our traditional Great Love Debate show, um, it's time to put an exclamation point on the sentence. So I wanted to share that. Um, all of you guys are a, a larger, every single one of these episodes probably gets a larger a, a, um, audience than dozens of those shows combined. Um, but I want to share it. So it's breaking news. I've kind of hinted at it before. You guys know at the end of these shows, I say, oh, my live tour schedule, check it out. And I'm not quite as enthusiastic about it where I used to... Uh, rattle off the next 15 shows in the various accents of the city that I was traveling to, like Boston. Um, but that's it. So this podcast will continue, obviously, over and over and over. 
Um, tickets are on sale for that show and possibly some others in between. Greatlovedebate.com. Shoot me an email, greatlovedebate at gmail.com. If you make me an offer, I can't refuse to say, no, you got to do one more show in Dallas. I'll think about it. Um, please like, share, follow, and review this podcast. Your reviews, even when I get off the stage, will always mean a lot in the podcasting ecosystem because, as always, at The Great Love Debate, we never stop making love. See you next time. Thank you.